Um, just quickly about us. So Peter and I are the co-founders of Tribe Global. Tribe Global, we, we describe ourselves as human transformation architects, which is really helping humans and organizations through change, transitions and transformation. Uh, and this is because humans aren't naturally good at it and organizations are even worse at it. So we run a program called Peak Persona, which is a human accelerator program, which is really about helping humans get out of their own way, um, achieve some self-realization so that they can grow, but more importantly, they can realize their untapped potential. Uh, we, we've got two bio slides here, but we'll just leave them here. You can, you know, if you're interested in finding out more about us, that's really just for context of the experience space we're talking from. But Peter, do you, do you want to quickly just give context to who you are? Yep. Hey everybody, my name is Peter. I'm looking at the attendee list and I think there's a lot of people there who, um, who know me already and I know a lot of you, which is awesome. It seems like an amazing, I keep looking across, if you see me looking across the screen, I've actually got two screens and I'm, I have the chat window over here. So don't think I'm being disinterested because um, I like to uh, have it all spread out so I can see what's going on. But um, I obviously uh, am co-founder with Aaron in Tribe Global and Peak Persona, which we've been running for two years now. And we, were, we still have the daily discussion <laughs> on what actually we do and what the end goal is. What we do know is we um, get so much satisfaction from this and working with people on their journeys. Majority of the people that we work with are entrepreneurs and founders of our startup companies or early stage technology companies, simply because that is the space that we came from. And that's the space that we operate in. I am an entrepreneur myself. I've had multiple businesses. So uh, we have created our programs based off routines and structures that have both worked for us and also that we know uh, via implementation and um, working closely with founders, what really shifts the dial and changes the perception of what entrepreneurs need to do on a daily basis. And it really does come down to a simple in theory, very difficult to do in practice set of routines and structures and rich rituals and also a toolkit, which we truly believe it's, it's the art of remembering what comes naturally to us as people. And we've learned a new term recently called de-schooling which is the unprogramming of everything that you get programmed into you from pretty much the time you go to school. And we've, the whole world's gone through this recently because we have had to pause and not go to school and not go to work and um, be programmed as much. So this is more relevant now than ever and getting people um, to tune into their own self, understand what works for you and harness the power that you already have. I suppose, in being able to execute a lot of these things, removing the barriers. So that is um, what we do now. There is a bunch of history there, which is you can have a look on what I've done previously, but that is what I'm super passionate about right now. And I think topics like this uh, get me extremely excited. So I can't wait to share with you today what we're going to have a chat about. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm Aaron. So most of my life as an entrepreneur and founder myself and uh, I've started too many, I was going to say too many companies to count, but it's not, I can, I can actually count to 14, uh, but sold or exited five of them now. And but really the, the, the journey of, I think the last seven years is, is probably where I've found my passion point. And that is helping other entrepreneurs and, and humans to grow. And I think that last point Peter mentioned there around, uh, you know, the, the de-schooling, I think so many of us are conditioned through school, through employment, through work, um, but also just through the nature of our lifestyles to be constantly living in a state of reaction where we're told what to do at any given moment. We're told when to arrive at work. We all go for coffee at the same time. We all go for lunch at the same time. We all leave the office at the same time. Uh, and we never actually reconnect with self. And we see it manifest when people quit their day jobs to go and form a startup and suddenly they, t they, they forget how to adult. They can't take care of themselves. They don't eat. They don't sleep. They develop mental health issues. Um, and really the content today is all about coming back to self so that we can do the hard things because we've forgotten actually how to choose what we want to do and then how to follow through on our decisions rather than just constantly being told what to do by a notification on our phone or an email in our inbox that's asking something of us or a need of our children or spouse or someone else. So a lot of the content today is actually all about bringing it back to you. What do you want to achieve? And then how do you get out of your own way in many ways to actually achieve it? So when we talk about hard things, it's important to understand that um, 
we're not just talking about, you know, going off and, and setting a world record in some crazy adventure, although we will be talking about some of that today. We're talking about all the hard things, like hard conversations, those emotionally difficult moments, um, whether that's with employees, team members, your, your spouse, your children, um, firing people, um, setting goals for yourself and sticking to goals and holding yourself accountable. Um, you know, often these challenges are, are things like health and, and fitness challenges. How do we actually eat healthy? Uh, how do we look after ourselves can be a difficult thing. So when we talk about hard things, it's really that broad context. And what we'd love, this would really help us frame the rest of the content, is if you could all use the chat window or the Q&A window to drop what it is you consider a hard thing. What's the hard thing that you're not doing that you wish you could do? Um, what's a goal that you've had for a while that's just undone? What's, what's a hard thing you've tried before and, and maybe failed on? But what are the hard things to you? Are they hard conversations? Are they starting a business? Is it um, in a context of a relationship? Is it context of your health? But it'd be really awesome if you could start dropping some context in the, in the Q&A window. Um, so for Jess has mentioned here, like running, which is a, a great goal, Jess. Uh, but drop them in the chat. We'll keep reading through. And as uh, I've noticed, a lot of people have just joined. So I'm assuming um, Ben Southall's webinar is finished and you've all come over. <laughs> but just drop in the Q&A window any questions that you're struggling with. Um, Jess has also mentioned giving up Coke Zero. Ruth is mentioning balancing everything, which, yeah, absolutely. Um, choosing harder tasks at work. Yes. Choosing ambiguity, Lucy. Absolutely. Putting happiness before money and decision making, yes. Staying positive, the juggle. I think Peter and I were talking about this this morning, actually, the you know, work-life balance. And pre-COVID, I think everyone was sort of a bit more, had a tendency to bias towards work. And now I feel during COVID, everyone's sort of biased towards life. Now we're going to feel the juggle of going back, going back into work. Um, awesome. So keep sending them through. We'll keep reading them. We're noticing like a lot of balance questions, balancing kids, kids on devices, pushing through the fear. Yes, yes, yes. Fixing other people's problems and how to stop fixing theirs and not your own. Yes. It's an easy... Leave it on time, good sleep. Yeah, there's lots of that. Cool. So keep, keep posting. As you think of ones, keep thinking of Jana's talking about... Oh, sorry, Jana's talking about talking to customers. Yes, yeah, so selling can be a real fear. So really, and I've stolen this from a page of Mel Robbins' book, um, should have, could have, would have, did. And there is something that separates the should have, could have, would have people from those that do. And we'll be sharing some of that today. And the beauty of it is these, there's techniques. It's all learnable. Um, that we actually, if we're really honest with ourselves, most of it actually know what we should be doing. We're just not doing it. And so really it's that, that last piece. Why are we not doing it? And how do we overcome? How do we create a construct in which we do do? Um, Peter and I mentioned we run Peak Persona, we run other things, and we have the luxury of working and knowing with uh, knowing amazing people, uh, including Yaz. So Yasmin, if you don't know Yaz, she's the founder of World's Biggest Garage Sale. And uh, this week, she just celebrated her 500th consecutive day of running. And she has a goal at the moment, which is to run 10K a day for 100 days, which I think is she 30 days in, Peter? I can't remember, something like that. She is, yep. Yeah. So already three hundred. the 10K mark, yes. Yeah. Uh, but she shared a tweet um, stream this week about her 12 tips of, of, you know, how did she do that? And as a Peak Persona alumni, um, it's so much of it resonated. And a lot of that you'll see in the content today. As well as uh, Yaz, we also have an amazing, um, the, the amazing Eleanor Carey in our alumni group as well. So those of you who don't know Eleanor, uh, she's a venture in residence at QUT, but she also runs her own micro adventure business. And uh, she set two world records rowing across the ocean. So the first Aussie, in fact, right now, the only Aussie to have ever rowed the Pacific Ocean, um, but also the first crew of three men or women to, to row an ocean. And uh, when I say rowed an ocean, it was over 4,000 kilometers from LA to Hawaii in this tiny boat that you can see on the screen. 62 and a half days and that's 62 and a half more, days. It's pretty much more like a canoe with a little bit of a canopy on the end. So not much of a boat. Yeah. And it was three hours on the oars, three hours off. So we'll be sharing a lot of the strategies that Eleanor talks about in terms of how she did that, because for context, 
she hadn't been in the open ocean before this. She hadn't rowed in a boat before this. And she had all of eight weeks to prepare. She had eight weeks notice to get in the boat to go spend 62 days with total strangers. Uh, Mark Salby. So many of you would know Mark Salby is the founder of Blue Sky Funds. Also the first Queensland chief entrepreneur. Uh, but Mark swam the English challenge uh, channel, sorry, the English channel in 2015. And uh, we'll share some of his te techniques of how he did that. Because before that, he was not a swimmer. He hated swimming. Um, and Ben Robert Smith. So Peter had uh, the luxury of interviewing uh, Ben uh, when she was CEO of River City Labs. And Ben is the Victoria Cross recipient for Valor um, in the field under combat. So he deliberately- He's also in the media for a lot of other things at the moment. So look, when we did this uh, interview, it was all very positive. It's since been um, tainted a little bit, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, he still uh, did a lot of, or achieved a lot of things. There's also a lot of uh, under scrutiny for a lot of things. It also, that probably aren't uh, very positive at all. Yeah. And lastly, our peak persona program. So um, we recently completed a, a second cohort of our next level program, which is one of our, what well, is it is currently our hardest program. Um, and I don't want to give away the, the secrets of what we do in there, but basically we, we get participants to do things they don't want to do. Uh, you know, a week of cold showers and ice baths and giving up all the luxuries of alcohol and coffee and other things and doing insane activities that any rational person would say, why on earth are you doing that? But the whole point of it is so that we learn about ourselves because by doing hard things, we become better at doing hard things. And by and it's the reaction and how you react to it. And this is, it's never actually about the task. It's, it's more to do with your, first of all, reaction to being told what to do. So for me, that's a massive trigger, number one. Uh, before I even hear, before my brain can even understand what the instruction is, I have an immediate negative response to being told what to do. So already... I'm being triggered, then the task, I will come up with lots of different excuses. Well, why it can't happen, not at that time or not in that format um, because my own conditioning is, is to do things a certain way, which is my way <clears throat> or it doesn't happen. So to unprogram uh, a lot of those types of behaviours or to understand your reactions because what happens is the more you understand it, when something happens to you, you can then learn to respond differently opposed to letting things happen to you and then flip that mindset to being, why is this happening for me? What can I learn from it and what can I do differently? So we, we engineer these moments or these days, all these tasks to make people feel uncomfortable and they're not, and, and the individual sets the things that they uh, want to give up or, or do without and it is a, it's, it's like doing a boot camp of, of deprogramming and to look at your reactions continuously. And sometimes when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's like, it's like watching a toddler having a tantrum in the middle of the shopping center and you're 42 years of age and you go think, what the hell are you doing? This is ridiculous. But until you see yourself and have that mirror and you, and you look and you go, well, that, well, that's crazy. Um, then only then can you do something about it. But when you're in life and everything's overwhelming, you can't clearly see what the problem is because often it's not the problem, it's your reaction to it. And, and that's the purpose of the program. Yeah, and it comes back to what you were saying before about de-schooling, like deprogramming our programming and actually re that requires us to recognise it. Um, one of the fascinating things is, is this body of work by Angela Duckworth, which... Basically, if you were to identify one trait that would determine whether someone's going to be successful or not, just one characteristic that if you measured that, you could predict with reasonable confidence whether or not someone was going to achieve what they're setting out to achieve, it's grit. Absolutely just your grit, your, your ability to stick something through even though you don't want to. And the problem is when we hear grit, we think naturally like physical grit, like physical strength or physical resilience. But like Peter was just saying, it's all in our head. It's actually our reaction. It's the self-talk. It's all the BS we make up about why we shouldn't do something or why it's just stupid. So to understand that, um, we've got this little um, analogy here, which is this condition called baby elephant syndrome. So when a, a small elephant is captured or born in captivity, it's chained and staked to the ground. So they use a large steel stake to chain that elephant to the ground. And look, it's a baby elephant. And it'll tug and tug and tug and tug on that chain and on that stake and not be able to get free. And through that process, it learns just to stop trying. It learns to give up. But the thing is that baby elephant becomes a big, huge elephant. And they actually 
still continue to chain it up. And the irony is they use an even smaller peg in the ground. Now that elephant could pull on that peg at any moment and actually release itself, but it never even tries to do it. And this photo actually shows six elephants, six massive beasts of animals that are chained to what you probably can't make out is a very small piece of timber dowel, which they could snap in an instant if any single one of those elephants bothered to move its legs, but they never do. Um, and it just highlights our conditioning. And the reality is we're, we all suffer baby elephant syndrome. We've all been programmed with limiting beliefs based on our past experiences about why we simply shouldn't even try. We, should, we, shouldn't, we don't even know that we should move our leg. And when we see the elephant that's free, that's off having an amazing life, we make these comments like, well, it's easy for you. Look at your situation. I'm here chained to this pole. If only we knew we could just pull and we'd be free. So that's what I encourage you to think about as we talk through these. It's, it's all about mindset. And one aspect of this, if you look at the psychology and the way the human brain forms, is that every thought that we have and every behavior we have actually trains us to do more of the same. So when Peter was talking about why it is we do next level, it's really to train ourselves to be able to do those things so that next time we face the hard thing and it's not in a program, we've already actually rewired our brain to be able to do it. So you need to be very conscious of every choice and all of your behaviors because they actually program you for your next choice and your next behavior. And Peter, one of the challenges we come up with all the time is people who won't drag their ass out of bed in the morning. Um, <laughs> In the, do you want to explain like the, the pre-dawn and, and what we see with people struggling to, to do these things? Yeah. Um, and when people actually ask what peak persona is, the first program that we, we run is a 14-day shift, which we call just to sort of shift gears and to shift and shake you out of your current um, existence. And we call it Adulting 101 simply because it is remembering how to actually look after yourself as an adult, which really does require the most basic things like drinking water, getting enough sleep, being uh, unplugging and, and um, switching off, having a good morning and evening routine and uh, giving yourself a little bit of time and choosing to tackle the day on your terms opposed to being a victim of things happening to you. And it's, it's as basic as that. We don't get people to do anything crazy. And you would think by some of the reactions, we're asking them to do insane things. But really, it's set your alarm and wake up before, pre, before dawn. Um, and it seems simple in theory. And 14 days out of 365 days in the year is such a short time. And this is exactly why we have problems with de de dealing with bigger things. Because if you cannot commit to yourself, for 14 days out of 365, there is no way you're going to tackle a bigger challenge because you haven't chosen to put your own needs or personal well-being or health first. And that's the it, and that is what it comes down to. What are you actually choosing to consciously do, no matter how uncomfortable this is going to make you feel, and how um, challenging it's going to be to step outside of what you would normally do. So we, we do the most basic, simple things to highlight. It's often just our, our internal resistance to doing things and to change. We don't like it. We don't like it. It's a little bit cold. It's a little bit something or it's a little bit too early or a little bit tired. The excuses that adults come up with is... Um, it's always very insightful and fascinating to know that uh, people who are in charge of parenting others often coming up with excuses and the stories that people tell to justify their behavior on why they actually didn't get up or why they turn the alarm off and went back to sleep or they can't get up and turn the alarm off or they don't have an alarm or the phone's not in the bedroom or the phone is in the bedroom and they really need something else or they slept through it. It's like uh, it, it, you, you really do, it, it's very obvious where a lot of these problems lie and they haven't made a conscious choice, choice to commit to themselves. And seeing grown adults come up with excuses about not waking up early is, um, it's, it's huge. It's fascinating. Or even drinking en enough water. Like literally giving yourself the most basic requirement of the day and why don't we actually do it? Why don't you sit there at all times with, you know, water next to your desk or in your car or in wherever it is it's, it's a choice, but you have to be on it. You have to be on it. You have to wake up and make the choice every day to commit to yourself before you tackle the bigger things because they're going to ask so much more of you. 
Yeah, and it, it really does require a lot of intellectual honesty about ourselves. And you know, this, this first step here is we, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to call out our own bullshit. And if you look at very successful people, they do have this intellectual honesty about their, themselves. They know what they're good at, but they also know what they're not good at. And that means that they know what help they need around them. They know how to structure their routines to fix the things that they're not good at. So you really need to be able to, first of all, just be very honest, very honest with others and very honest with yourself. And uh, Peter and I are huge fans of Mel Robbins. We use a lot of her content in our coaching and, and in our programs. And look, there's a lot of text on this slide here and you can always watch this later and you'll get access to the slides afterwards. But the key point of this is that humans are very good at creating an escape hatch. Anytime we have something hard to do, we um, immediately try, like Peter was just saying, we find all the excuses why we shouldn't do it or why it's not gonna work or whatever. And that's our escape hatch. And as Mel Robbins calls out, she calls it out bluntly. It's like, you're just lying to yourself. All of those things are lies because you know what? Other people have had far worse situation, far worse circumstance, far less capacity, far less ability, and they've done it. So if they've done it, you can too. And the point of what she says all the time is you just have to do the thing you don't want to do. It's as simple as that. We could end the seminar now and just say, do the thing you don't want to do and it's done. And it's a nice little philosophy to live by because it flips everything from thinking of it as too hard to just, well, okay, yes, it is hard, but I have to do it anyway. It's the same with giving up anything. And this is what people learn in the next level program is when you choose what your crutches are and you have to go without them for, um, you know, uh, seven to 14 days, our reactions and all of the things we tell ourselves in our heads. This is why we have addictions. This is why we're addicted to sugar, caffeine, alcohol, um, all, all the things, or we overconsume or overindulge in certain things rather than moderation is because it's really hard to, to, to um, say no to things. And you, you wonder, there is no magical formula to giving something up other than giving something up. That's simply what's required is you stop drinking the thing or you do not have coffee in the morning. If, if that's what you want, it's not I'm, not, I'm not saying you have to do it, but if that's the thing you've chosen, you literally have to just not do the thing that there, there's no other magical pill. It's a choice and you have to back it. And each day gets a little bit better and you feel a little bit more um, proud of yourself for going just another day without it. And it is just super, super easy to go off, oh, but, to give in again and then you're back to the start and it's this loop, continuous mm. loop. I think it's something key you said there was there's no magic pill and I think you know, self-help books are the most purchased but unread books of any category and it's because everyone's looking for what, what's the key answer? What's the, what's the 10 step? Just tell me what to do and there's no one key thing. So if you've come to this webinar today going, I'm going to learn this one key thing, like I can, I can spoil the punchline right now that you'll know everything you should be doing, you're just not doing it. And it's a small it's a hundred small things that you need to be doing consistently and regularly. Um, what we did after our next level program. So it was interesting, fascinating, taking 16 people through 30 days of pushing out of their comfort zones. And we actually broke down every one of their reflection videos into the 10 things, the 10 BS stories that they tell themselves why they shouldn't have to do something. And so that you can see them on this slide on the left hand side of the screen. And then on the right hand side of the screen, we took, for those video reflections where someone said, no, this one was really easy for me, we mapped the correlating thing so that you can see on the left, the exact correlation to someone who doesn't do something, to the right, someone who does. And it starts with how we see fear. So those that don't, those that don't do something, they, they see fear and they want to avoid it. Whereas those who are achievers, they see fear, they still feel the fear, but they do it anyway. And fear is actually the signal of a, of a growth opportunity. Anytime you feel fear, it's actually a signal of, oh, I've got something I can learn here. And when you approach it with that curiosity, then you're like, it's like a hell yes. You become this adrenaline junkie <laughs> that sees fear and goes, oh my God, now I have to do this. But, the but it's, it's, one, it's, it's ongoing. There is no magical, this is, this is the, I think the biggest misconception is you're never immune to falling back into getting comfortable again. And I've successfully given up coffee or, alcohol and you know here I am drinking coffee again because it's so nice and you go back and you're like damn I'm back there again and it's a continual effort to check in with yourself as a reminder on how it feels or if it's if it's having a negative impact or a positive impact and you justify and you tell yourself the stories so 
it's never, it's, you never complete. So I think it's one of those things to remind yourself that you could get to a certain state. It's like fitness, you know, the biggest, like uh, along with self-help book, books, so are gym memberships, probably not so much at the moment, but gym memberships, people, the simple fact of buying a gym membership gives you that little um, uh, endorphin rush to go, yep, I'm, I'm on the train, I'm going to be doing this, but you haven't actually gone and done a workout yet. You just purchased the gym membership, which gives you the perception that you're working towards yourself. Or achieving those goals. It's the same sort of thing um, with any of these uh, self-help books, programs, podcasts, TED Talks, whatever it is you're consuming, unless there is an action to cement the learning and to change a behavior, then nothing's really learned. You can consume it, consume it, consume it, feel better about it in your, in your mind, but until you actually take a step towards some sort of an action or a change, nothing really will actually change. And that's what we've observed in behaviors because part of the programs that we run is people actually have to do a daily check-in with themselves on how they're feeling we get to see how they're going because they have to put just one thing in action per day so it's you know the general story at the beginning of the year people are giving up sugar they're going on a diet they're doing a boot camp they've got a new gym membership and they're going to wake up early every day it's too many things at once you can't be expected to change if you're going to do all of these things at once you just choose one tiny micro goal to achieve and then you'd add another micro goal and another one and another one and then you can sort of build up a little bit of resistance or resilience to change and 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 benefit from the effects that you have either mentally and physically on those type of things yeah there's a couple of good comments i'll just read out but um uh, peter said you know if you want things to change you first have to change absolutely like the reality is we we have to change um, but also, you know, someone else said about, you know, a victim mindset. So we talk a lot about fixed mindset versus growth mindset. So fixed mindset believes I am the way I am and I can't change where a growth mindset is, oh, of course I can, I can do anything. Um, but then there's also an interesting question here from Claire about, you know, what about those who have gone through trauma or have mental or physical disabilities? And, and that's a really important point to recognize is that there are absolutely moments where we need to um, have that intellectual honesty with ourselves to say, we're not in a place right now where I can go and do these things. I need to deal with my traumatic experience. I need to process this. Um, I, you know, again, it comes back to that, having the honesty to recognize where we're at and what we need. And sometimes we get lost in the comparison to others and we just need to accept that right now, we can't go and do those things. We need to actually deal with these things before we move forward. But that of itself is facing a, a hard thing. Um, just coming back to this slide though, if you're looking on the left, like, so those that, that don't do hard things, they, they tend to reject it. They tend to say, well, this is stupid. This is pointless. I know better than this. This, this isn't going to help me. Versus those who do have this curiosity. They're like, well, this might make me 1% better. It's like, okay, I'm going to give this a go. What, what might I learn from this experience? Um, those that don't tend to say they're too busy. It's like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I don't have the time. Any, you need to remove the word busy from your vocab because busy is bullshit. Instead of saying, I'm too busy, say, I'm choosing to prioritize other things because that is what you're doing. You're choosing where you spend your time, so you haven't made it a priority. In other words, you don't care enough. And when you put it that way, it's very confronting, but it also gives you the power to change it. Um, blame. So some people will say, and this points to some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A, I can't because of this person in my life, or I can't because I'm in this situation, um, as opposed to those who just own their situation and say, well, how might I? Like, yes, I'm in this situation, but how might I do something? How might I make this work for me? Um, compare. So we see this a lot. Peter and I see this comparison piece a lot, um, you know, where people say, well, I'm not like them. I can't do that. I, it's easy for them. I'm not them. Um, I'm different. Whereas those that do have a more tendency, they don't look at others. They just look at themselves. And they're just like, well, this, I don't care what others have done. This is what I can do. Um, so again, it's bringing them back and, and they're not afraid of being misunderstood. They're not afraid of putting themselves out there and having others criticize them. There's two things to add to that. Um, and it is uh, something that Jocko Willink talks about is extreme ownership or radical ownership of your situation. And there are some things you just can't change and whether they're circumstances, um, life events, physical things that um, you may be facing, there's some things that you can't change and it's about owning them and recognizing what, what you can actually do and what you choose, what you're making a choice around. So there's some things that will 
no doubt be holding you back from something for a reason. And I think it's until you recognize what that is, how you can manage it and know that that is your situation, whether it can be changed or not, is going to be a game changer opposed to comparison, looking at other people, other people's lives, making assumptions on what, how easy it is for some people or how different situations are easy easier than yours or not um, because they're all assumptions remember you don't actually know the details or what goes on behind the scenes and a lot of people so it's really dangerous to make comparisons and the um, FOMO issue that comes up is also it's making a comparison to some what else somebody else is doing and how they're tracking and feeling like you're missing out but you don't actually know what's happening in that in that situation either so um, trying to avoid comparing and then 100% owning your current situation then there are times when you do also need to recognize that sometimes pushing is the opposite of what you need to be doing. Sometimes it could be more of a, uh, you need to be a bit more nurturing or you need to be a bit kinder to yourself. Sometimes if you've been in a difficult situation, the response is to go and punish and push harder and harder and harder, which will move you further away from that internal awareness or being gentler or kinder to yourself, which is maybe what you actually need as well. So there are two sides to the story here because everybody's situation is really diverse and different. Yep. I, just to quickly with the last couple there, because it came up in the Q and A, but you know, there's the self-sacrificing on the left. So often we tell ourselves again, to use Mel Robbins thing, we create our escape hatch by using the excuse, uh, well, I need to look after my kids or I can't justify this self-indulgent thing that I'm about to go and do. Whereas those that who do these things look at it as, well, if I do this hard thing, I'm going to be a better person who can actually give more to my kids and, and be more true. Um, the overthinking versus, versus done. So overthinking is a killer to, to doing hard things um, versus those who do, they just tend to, it's like, while the other one's thinking about it, they've already done it. And it's only through doing it, you can actually get the knowledge of what's needed to do it. And the last one, um, which Alicia's just mentioned in the comments too, um, near enough is good enough. So, so look, yes, absolutely done is better than perfect. So default to action. But sometimes, you know, how we do anything is how we do everything. And if we pretend like, oh, yeah, I did that hard thing, but you really didn't do it. You just told yourself you did it. You, that lives with you forever because that trains you next time to cut the corner again. And you'll cut the corner on the next thing and the next thing. And before you know it, you've degraded all different areas of your life as opposed to, you know, you having the honesty to yourself. It's like, I know I didn't do this to my standard. I can do better. I'm going to see this through to completion. And a great little quote that I use in my head all the time is pain is temporary, but quitting lasts forever. And it just drives me. It's like, I need to see this through to completion. So what's the answer? We've talked about all the problems. <laughs> what's the actual answer? Is there an answer? Is there a magical answer here? Yeah. But I think this little quote here, aim fire ready. So instead of, you know, um, aim ready fire, and we see this all the time. And both Peter and I have worked with Steve Baxter a lot, um, who you'd know from Shark Tank. And he's a classic example of aim, fire, ready. And most entrepreneurs are. It's like, what's the target? And then it's done. And the, the ready was never there. They never waited to feel like they knew what they were doing. They just did it. And it's only through the doing that they then felt ready to actually have been able to have done it. So now we're going to go through a heap of techniques, like actual action items, so that you can do the hard things. Um, starting with measuring the cost of inaction. Now this sound, might sound bizarre, but often we get stuck because we just don't want it bad enough. Like we're in a comfort zone, we're in this nice little place, we've got it, we're avoiding the hard conversation because you know what? It sucks and it's hard and it might make someone cry and it'll probably make them hate us and all these other things. So right now we're comfortable. It's like, why would I choose to do that? So that's why you need to measure the cost of inaction. You need to realize what you're actually sacrificing by not having that hard conversation or doing that hard thing. But most of us never actually take the time to quantify that, but you need to actually think about it because that becomes your driver. Um, someone mentioned FOMO is an issue. Make FOMO your driver. Like it, it's, it can be really powerful um, to actually drive you. JFDI, if you do forward like, thinking to, how will I feel when I know that I didn't do that thing that everyone else has gone and done, which is, um, or, I, or I missed out and I could have started at this time, but and now we're a month down the track and I'm sort of a bit behind. So I think we, if it is FOMO, forward, fast forward to how you think you will feel at the end if you didn't start when you thought you should have and see if that will help sort of boost you along to kicking, kicking into gear. Yeah. 
JFDI is a mantra that we live by and the startup community lives by, but it's just fucking do it. And it's like, you almost need to tattoo this on the back of your hand so that you just see it there. Anytime you, you hesitate or in doubt, just do it. And it's that action will cure fear because action is, is the annihilator of fear. And this uh, comes back to the waking up early. I even had, I listened to somebody's reflection this morning saying, I've been waking up, but then going back to sleep. It's like, well, hang on a minute. You've been waking up, but you didn't swing around and put your feet on the floor. Because if you had to put your feet on the floor, you would have stood up and then gone to the next thing, which is walking to get dressed to maybe go and do something. But waking up and laying there is, is not doing it. It's just listening to an alarm and being inactive. So there's, there's, there's so many follow through points that doing it means sitting up, standing up, getting up, one thing to the next, one thing to the next, one thing to the next. And thinking about it or committing to it in your mind is, is not enough. That action has to follow through. Yeah, and we see it all the time. Like this quote, um, Yoda, you know, they're, 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 it's do or do not, there is no try. And we pick it up in language all the time. You can tell straight away when you're listening to someone, if they're using conditional statements, like I might do that tomorrow, or I'll try and do that, or I should do that. You know, they've already decided they're not doing it. Someone who is a doer will just own it. There's like, I am doing this, therefore it will be. And there's, there's zero doubt in their language because they've decided they're doing it. So the people who get up in the morning and get out of bed easily are the ones who laid out their gym gear the night before. Their shoes are ready to go. You know, the phone's on the other side of the room and they have to get up. They've already, up, they've already basically built their life into the assumption, into the knowledge, into the fact that they are doing it. As opposed to those that say, oh yeah, I'll try and do that. It's like, no, you're just giving yourself an out. You're not gonna do it. So be really conscious of your language. Brick by brick. Peter, do you want to talk about Mel Robbins' technique of chunking things down into small things? Yeah, it's, it goes back to the, either the, the um, uh, little tiny micro achievements or micro acts of bravery. And often we have, especially when we're thinking about big goals, whether it's a business goal or it's a personal goal or it's some sort of adventure goal or um, we, we have them, but then it's like, it's so big. I'm not really sure where to start, but I still want to have it because it makes me excited But each time I think about it, but are you actually making any active steps towards that goal? And for example, in business, um, uh, for, in a lot of the Mel Robin books, she's off, she talks through, um, a lot of her clients as a coach and talks through their stories and they might be very frustrated in their current job. And she'll ask a question like, what, what, what would you really like to do? And it could be someone who works in a like, government and say, well, I really like to own a wine bar. So instead of in their head, it's like, well, I could never own a wine bar. I don't know anything about running a business. I don't know anything about wine. I just think it would be a really nice idea. So that the end goal seems so far away with way too many steps. It's just kept up here as a dream. So ways to break it down into a small achievable brick by brick um, movements is to take one step towards that, which is if you're interested in wine, is there a job that you could go and get right now, part-time or volunteer to start learning more about wine? Is there a wine shop that you could work in? Is there a small bar to go and see if you even are interested in hospitality? Do you like being around people? So if you take that one step and go, yes, this is for me or no, it's not. Then you go, I would like to work full time in this. I need to leave my government job, get involved in hospitality over time. Then you can learn a little bit about business. What does it actually take to go and open a lease, to set up a place? You have to do the small steps before the big step. You can't just leave your job, go and lease a building and try and work it all out later on because it's, it's, it would be too much of, of a burden. You'd have to upskill rapidly. Um, but the pressure of something like that is enough to deter anybody from taking any active steps towards um, anything. So for, for me, I have a personal goal to be a very bendy, zen out yoga person. But I've been saying this for years, sadly, and I've done nothing about it. Except now I actively do 30 minutes of yoga every single morning. But I was coming up with all the most ridiculous exclusives because in my head, I needed to be living on the top of a mountain somewhere with an ocean view to be the zen out person, which is not, that is not going to happen. I could literally stretch myself each morning to start working towards the physical part of being a yoga person. And then I can get to the other bits later on. But so we have to, I had to break it down into a small achievable brick for me. And for that was committing to my physical goal of doing those types of things. And then you can sort of evolve from there, but you have to make it real. You have to make it achievable and you have to take action on the small task first before you can get anywhere close to the big one. 
Yeah. Um, a similar um, concept is something we call decision gates. So when we have a massive challenge or task ahead of us, sometimes we, we don't know if we want the outcome or we're, we're so uncertain that we, we just don't commit at all. And what we, what, the way we need to think about it is just think, well, all I need to commit to is getting to the next gate. So I'll give an example. When Eleanor got the call to go and um, row the ocean to be part of this team because another person had, had fallen out of the team, Usually they train for two years before taking part in, in, the, um, in the race. But Eleanor had eight weeks notice and she was debating, should I, should I do this? And it's like, well, all you need to do is commit to the next step, which was for her, she had all these training courses to do to just be allowed in the boat. And then when she got to that point, it's like, then all you have to commit to do is get on the plane to go to LA. And once you're there, you just have to commit to meeting the crew for the first time. And then once you're there, get in the boat for the first time. At that point, you can walk away. But once you're in the boat, and, and she had a moment the night before um, she rang me from the hotel room the night before just questioning, should I, like, what am I doing? This is insanity. But it's like, all you need to do is get in the boat in the morning. And once you get in the boat, you could always get out. And then once you're in the boat, all you need to do is get to the next gate. Like just row to the end of the bay. And once you're at the end of the bay, you know what, if it's too much, you can get out. And the thing is we build ourselves up like, oh, if I take this first step, I'm committed the rest of my life. So if you have commitment issues, you need to just think of, I'm just committing to the next step you can then back out. So any of you that are facing a job interview and you're thinking, oh, I, I would never get this job or I don't know, how would I feel about working in this company? Would I, like, would I even enjoy um, living in Sydney for this role? It's like, rewind, back the truck up. All you need to commit to is doing your CV and sending it in. You may not even get an interview. Then when you get the interview, you've got another gate where you could take the second interview or you choose not to. There's always an out. So decision gates are really powerful. And this is a good time to bring up there's often it's very much talked about that people have a fear of failure on getting things wrong there's actually a fear of success as well so some people have these big goals and they in their head want to be that person or be can envisage kicking these goals but they're not making any active steps towards getting there they're staying in a safe zone where they're comfortable in business and they've achieved a certain amount of success but the reality of actually taking the next step and going it, which is which will in which will be another set of challenges. But it's also the reality of if this is successful, I could be really successful here. What what's going to be required of me as well? So not that it's going to fail. I actually, know it's going to work. But I know I'm going to have to level up massively, and that can be really scary as well. So there's absolutely a fear of being more successful than you currently are, and that's enough to also pause your um, growth as well and a lot of these decision gates is knowing that you only need to get to one step and you will level up and you will grow and you will acquire all the skills you needed you need to get to the next level again just like you did to get to where you are now so we deal with both people coming from starting everything from scratch to those wanting to take where they're at right now up again a few steps further yeah and exactly what you just said there is this quote from Eleanor which is you know every step of that journey, you're gonna be a different person. So by using decision gates and chunking and, and using bricks, you, you recognize that well, when I complete the first step, I'm gonna be a different human. I'm gonna have new skills. So when I have to face the second step, which, step, which right now seems so daunting, I'm gonna be ready by then because I'll have completed the first step. And so you need to understand when you're making a decision, you're choosing this big, hairy, audacious goal, who you are when you're completing that goal will be completely different to you right now. And Eleanor said it wasn't until two weeks into rowing across the ocean that she was a person who could row across the ocean. And there was no other way she could have prepared other than getting in the boat and doing it. So understand who you're going to be as a result of the journey is very different or even on the, on the journey is very different to who you are now. And what that means is you just need to tell yourself just one more step. And when you make that step, you just go one more step. And Eleanor talks about this in the boat. Like they are, um, someone asked her recently, I think it was you, Yana, on, on your um, Yarning with Yana segment. It was like, how on earth did you commit to rowing for 62 days? And she goes, I didn't. I committed to rowing for the next three minutes. And then at the end of that three minutes, I committed to getting on the boat in the first place. <laughs> getting, <laughs> exactly. plane, getting on the yeah. plane. Because you just commit to the next thing that's right in front of you. That's all you have to commit to. Do that, and when you get to the end of it, just one more, just one more, just one more. Which leads us into the five second rule. So, Mel Robbins' first uh, book was all about how do you make decisions. And so, basically, if you make a decision within the first five seconds of a thought entering your mind, you'll prevent what we call the dot, 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 which is where you start coming with up all the excuses in your head why you shouldn't do something. 
But if you lean into a decision, like it's literally you, your body is falling and you just lean in, go with your gut instinct. And Peter talks about this a lot. Her gut instinct is always right. It's just sometimes she doesn't act on it. And then all this other stuff comes up, does all the loop and ends up right back at the gut instinct. So or not doing anything at all. And then yeah. you're in you've got FOMO because you could have done something and missed the opportunity and you've just overthought it. So the overthinking for me is, um, it is a demon of mine that I have to really actively rein in and I can identify now where my mind is now, you know, going off onto a tangent, which doesn't need to. Um, and then a lot of self-talk can come in uh, on the back of that and either deter me from doing something or be too negative when my first initial reaction was the to do. Um, and I need to learn to listen to that and, and trust that. And it's, it's a training thing to be aware of what actually uh, comes naturally to you and how to be guided by those types of um, messages or thoughts, however they come to you. It, this one seems to be resonating. So I'm getting a lot of open comment questions. A lot of direct messages are saying, you know, overthinking is the absolute killer for most people. So use this technique. Every time you have a, a decision, five, four, three, two, one, go. And Mark Salby, who I mentioned at the start, he, he taught me this around training my gut instinct. And actually you can develop your gut instinct and actually start training it. So when you get it wrong, you transition and train your gut to be right the next time. So, Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, another technique is a pre-mortem. So sometimes we avoid doing things because there's a very high risk of failure. So anything hard has an epically high risk of failure. But if you actually sit down, I mean, often this is just a fear of failure, right? If you actually sat down and did a pre-mortem, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this thing. What are all the ways it could go wrong? And th many of you have mentioned hard conversations in your questions um, that are coming through. Even in a hard conversation, just actually sit down and go, what's the worst case scenario? What is the worst thing that could happen? Like, okay, this hard conversation, the person could stab me. <laughs> but when you actually go through it and really break it down and you get out of the emotional space of fear, you can start thinking about, well, is that really realistic? Will that happen? But also, how can I mitigate against it, mitigate against it happening? What, what can I do to prevent it from happening? Those conversations or the pre-mortem around having those hard conversations and usually if it's in business, it's around funding and staff and the reality of the situation. And we always encourage people to be as honest and open and transparent as, as transparent as possible. Um, because we also think it's a, believe it's a form of manipulation to withhold information from somebody else uh, because you perceive it to be better to protect them from the information. But that's just your assumption. You don't actually know that that's a reality. So your decision-making process is based on assumption. It's not real at all. And you're manipulating the situation by um, withholding information opposed to being open and honest. And usually the worst case scenario in having a difficult situation, a conversation is that you're going to feel uncomfortable, that you're actually going to feel uncomfortable. And when you break it down like that and you say the worst thing that can happen right now is I'm going to have to admit something that I don't like. I'm going to be the person that I never thought I would be or admit to doing something that I'm not really happy about. But know that if that's the worst thing that's going to be the outcome of this situation, then it's not that bad being honest. It's not that bad managing the reaction of someone's emotions. Remember how people react is on them. Now, I'm not saying you can go and inflict all this emotional trauma for someone else, but essentially everybody has to own their own reaction to information. And all you can do is be open and honest and mindful of this uh, when you're having difficult conversations, but that should be enough to get you through um, knowing that people have to own their own reaction as well. But openness, vulnerability and transparency are probably the most powerful things that you can have, especially in business. Yeah, I mean, the, the work of Brene Brown, where she talks about, you know, that the greatest act of courage is being vulnerable. And being vulnerable means putting yourself out there to be judged. Um, and, and so hard conversations, which it's not surprising that many of you mentioned that, is an incredibly hard thing to do. And yeah, it was very confronting when I think Mel Robbins' content touched on how we manipulate others through withholding information telling ourselves it's protecting them, but ultimately we're just protecting ourselves. We're avoiding the pain of self, not of them. And that, that really hit me when I read that. And, and now I understand it. Uh, micro resolution. So Peter mentioned the phrase before micro uh, acts of micro bravery. And I, I love that term micro bravery, but the concept of a micro resolution. So a few of you mentioned, um, so two of you mentioned writing a book. 
So writing a book is this big goal, right? But if you just say, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write for 15 minutes every morning. As soon as I wake up, I'm going to get up and write for 15 minutes every single day. That's a micro resolution. It's not a goal of so many words or so many pages. It's just I'm, I'm dedicating time to this. So if you want to learn the guitar, just commit to 10 minutes of guitar every single day. And your goal, if you can get 1% better every single day, that compounds over time, has a massive impact. So micro resolutions, there's a book by Caroline Arnold um, on this very topic. The other part of micro resolutions is that, um, so this quote here, 100% is, is often easier than 99. And by that, what we mean is doing something every single day without fail is actually easier to do than to do something where you, you know, it's like, oh, I'll have today off. Because what that does is program your brain where it's okay to have a day off. And then the next day I'll have another day off. And so again, how you do anything is how you do everything. When Mark Sowerby, I first met Mark Sowerby when he was training for um, the um, ocean, uh, for the, not ocean, <laughs> for the um, swimming the English channel. And he said that he, he hated swimming. He didn't want to swim and that's why he chose to swim. And he trained for two years, six, um, six days a week, minimum two hours a day for two years. And his commitment to himself was if he missed a single training session, didn't matter if it was hailing, whatever, electrical storm, whatever, if he missed a single training session, he was going to resign as CEO of his company because he wasn't the person who should be running a company if he couldn't do it. But that commitment to 100% is easier than giving yourself some slack because when you slack off, you're more likely to slack off again and again and again. That's quite an extreme example though. <laughs> uh, and it is just to highlight a version of thinking, but there is also the flip side of that is to also, like we've mentioned before, you can definitely have good routines and habits, but know how you react when you do slack off because sometimes it could be worse for you even though having a, a, a sleep in or a lion and if you 100% want that and you go and enjoy it for everything that it is, then do that. But if you know you're going to go into some negative self-talk and beat yourself up about failing, then, then it's not worth the lion, how you, how you treat yourself afterwards. And so it's really important to be aware of your thoughts and actions when you choose to, how you, how to structure your routine and your behaviors. Yeah. And, and it's not to say go commit to doing something every single day. Maybe for you, your, your training, regime is you know, every third day but once you commit to something the whole point of Angela Duckworth's research around um, grit is that once you set something you're that's it you do it you do it you do it you do it um, so it's whatever you set for yourself and being realistic in setting that expectation correctly for you and your situation so it doesn't mean you have to do something every day maybe you commit to every three days but if that's your decision you have to commit to it because that's what grit is and Jess um, what Peter said just resonates right like it becomes your half arsing. You let yourself off one day and then you end up in this decision fatigue and then it ends up compounding this negative psychology of, oh my God, now I'm annoyed at myself because I didn't do this yesterday. So it is That's about alignment, much. expectation and commitment. Yeah. There's also two sides to this. And if you are um, a person who likes to, you know, the people pleaser or you self-sacrifice, some people would never, ever, ever, ever let anybody else down. They will never be late for something. They will always show up. They will deliver, but they will not do it for themselves. It's like, oh, this is important to me. Um, I think it's really important. And in the interview that I did with Ben Robert Smith, he did make a point of saying whether something was essential or whether it was important. And for him, the morning routine wasn't essential, but it was extremely important to him. So he made a commitment to himself every day to meet the needs of his, his own personal needs because it was very important to him. He treated that decision as if it was... Uh, a job or a boss or something because you've got to, a lot of people think well I don't want to be seen as that person who doesn't deliver I don't want to be seen as that person who doesn't show up or give their all but then you won't do it for yourself but you'll do it for the perception of how you want to be which is out of alignment of who you actually are because often we put the perception of the out to the world of who we want to be seen as but what we're doing to ourselves is not in alignment the key is to do this part first and then the world it, everyone will see it because you are it you are giving yourself the best first before um, others. Uh, as well as micro resolutions or one of your micro resolutions could be to eat the frog. Um, so Brian Tracy wrote this book, but basically frog or toad tasks are those things that are on your to-do list that you just don't want to do. So they're hard things. And um, you know, this could be that phone call you've put off. It could be sales. Um, a couple of you mentioned sales, all those sort of things. 
But the concept of eating the frog is to put it first in your day. So you block out your calendar each morning with 30 minutes of um, frog eating time or toad task time. And in that, you do the thing you don't want to do first in your day. And there, there's two reasons. One is, if you, put it, like if you put it off, you spend all of this time thinking about it. So if you, if you leave it until the end of the day, it's on your mind, you stew on it, and you just end up feeling shit all day. You go and do all these other things, like you procrastinate, suddenly your houses never look cleaner. But if you put it first, the opposite happens. So then you have the positive, you get it done, and you feel freaking phenomenal. And that carries into the rest of your day where suddenly you're getting everything done. You're having this amazing productivity time because if I can do that hard thing, then all this other stuff is easy. And if you look at the people who actually achieve the best, it's not that they don't have frog tasks. They, they just have bigger frog tasks. They're so used to doing these hard, ridiculous things that everything else now feels easy. So if you want to be motivated, go find uglier frogs and put them first in your day. Um, I've noticed it's come up to 11.30. Um, we, so I think the Eventbrite booking was 90 minutes. We've, we've still got probably about half an hour, but please do keep asking questions. I know you, um, Peter's been answering some in the text box. Please do keep asking your questions through as well. Listen to music. Why, why are we telling people to listen to music, Peter? Oh, I don't think you heard me. <laughs> no, sorry, it froze there for a second. Sorry, <laughs> what did I you say? I you to talk about music and why why we use um, persona playlists. Yeah, music um, is is the opportunity to have what we call a third space or a transition. And uh, now more than ever, especially being at home, I'm missing out on my commute to work. I um, going backwards and forwards to the gym in the morning. Um, the coming home from work to transition from work mode to home mode. I'm sitting in one room with everybody around me all day and I need that music transition more than ever. And for me, it's be able to take my head, a turn off or quieten my mind sometimes so that I can either focus on the task that I am doing or have a little bit of a brain break and switch modes of either needing to ramp up or ramp down or energize myself. So obviously things like this, we need to bring a lot of uh, energy and we need to be focused and be um, engaged and sometimes life happens and you need to adapt and change to that. We can't always have these perfect days and this is what the having structured routines and um, schedules will enable you to be aware of on how you are and you can't always gauge how you're going to feel but what we can know is you can engineer mood sometimes and help to shift and change how you feel and you react to things. So let's say your morning hadn't been so great and you needed to bring some energy to either punch out a bunch of work or you need to have a meeting or you need to have one of those difficult conversations or you need to calm yourself down to then go into home mode and be a bit more present with your kids or your partner you can actually engineer your mood or help shift and change some certain certain things with both physical exercise and music music is one of those things that is very easily and readily accept, um, accessible with your phone earphones um and it's just listening and engineering music for mood and if you're not used to regularly listening to music it could be a good trigger or a reminder or a, um, something to put on your to-do list to delve back into music and find out what you actually like and how it makes you feel and for me i have got separate se separate music that i play on the weekends um to put me into a bit more of a relaxed mode then i've got music i listen to when i exercise in the mornings and different um different modes of action will help me get or more pumped up or more active when I actually need to do some really good work. Yeah. And music helps with the passing of time. So it takes, you can take your, your mind, like your conscious thought process out of your body. So if you, if you're completing something like a marathon, you know, having music is a great way to do it. Um, when Salby swam the channel, he was in the water, he was swimming for 14 hours and he'd actually designed a music playlist in advance, knowing his emo how his emotional state and energy would be at each point. And then, so that music, engineered a change in his mindset um but formula one drivers before the race starts will sit in their cars you'll see they'll have their headphones on and they have specific playlists they're listening to to put them into a certain mindset to engineer their psychology um, which comes back to being very careful of what we feed our brains so if you're about to embark on something really hard to do um, avoid reading something that's emotionally triggering or um, you know, if, you, if you've just gone through a separation, avoid listening to that broken heart love song and then expecting yourself to be in this great mood to go and run a marathon. 
So, be, you know, as much as I guess we're saying music can be used for this positive benefit, you also need to be conscious of not putting negative feeders into your brain. Um, avoid reading those trigger topics um, and, and those, that content. Imposter syndrome, we won't draw on this too much, but, you know, imposter syndrome is a sense of feeling like you're not qualified to do something. And, and often when we feel that, we come back to um, thinking we need to go and get credentials. So Peter and I see this all the time. Someone's starting some new startup or they've got this idea and they're like, well, I'm going to go to university and do a degree in it as if they need that degree to then be able to start the business. We don't need credentials. What we need is experience. We need just to take ourselves and go and do. And everyone experiences imposter syndrome. Um, David Cohen, who is one of the founders of Techstars, has multiple venture capital funds worth billions of dollars now. But he was talking about, you know, when they raised their first, 400 million, uh, first $100 million fund, the day they raised it, they actually raised over $100 million. And he came home to his wife, Billy, incredible imposter syndrome, and just goes, can you believe how effing stupid all of these investors are? They just gave me all this money and I have no idea what I'm doing. And the kicker is, I mean, that fund was very successful. He then went on to raise a $400 million fund. And when he came home <laughs> after raising the $400, $400 million fund, he had the exact same conversation with his wife, which was, can you believe how stupid these investors are? I have no idea what I'm doing. It's a natural feeling. We are all going to feel it. Hard things are hard exactly because we don't know how to do them yet. And so it's a natural feeling and you just need to push through it. Buddy up. So um, you, you really should take other people on the journey. If you want to make the journey easier and if you want to have a better experience while doing the journey, find a buddy to do it with. So you don't have to do things alone. Um, so if you do have an epic challenge ahead of you, find a buddy to take with you. Um, you'll be more likely to complete it. You've got accountability, but you also have a better experience. And then that comes into building your tribe. So, Peter, do you want to perhaps talk about building your, your pit crew and who you should have in your, your pit crew around you? Yeah, it's like any, any uh, professional or competitive sport has a team of coaches and or team members, coaches, um, nutritionists, um, therapists, but entrepreneurship or being in business and operating yourself, often you, it's a very lonely journey. But you do need a lot of support around you and it's recognising what you actually need. And again, it comes back to the honesty piece. How honest can you be with yourself to know what you really need to unlock either your potential so you can perform better, so you can be more honest with yourself. Who's going to call out on, call you bullshit? Who's going to push you? Who understands uh, your ability and strengths a little bit better than you to be that reminder when you can't see it anymore, when you need to push further or when you need to pull back um, and to, and to have those right people around you. And that's a combination of people in your private home relationship space as well. Um, I often talk about having six different types of people in your life, which are what we call um, your, your micro tribe, which will, will round out the experience. And a lot of them are in your life for, for the whole time. They might be your parents, they could be your best friends, they could be your life partner. Um, then other people come and go on journeys and you might meet them in an industry or at an event or when you're traveling and it could be a pivotal, pivotal moment where they just drop a little piece of information or highlight something that may um, change the course of your life or help you to make a decision at that key, key point in time. So understanding first what you actually need is you have to go through that self-exploration phase to know that where your gaps are and then put a call out for someone to help. And just, you need to have that uh, relationship contract to say, when I'm doing this, can you please call me on that? I actually really need it. I'm going to respond this way. It's going to probably look very negative, but I actually need it. And being honest about that and having that openness and um, being really vulnerable to explain what you actually need does take a lot of self-awareness and it's worth doing so that you've got that tribe around you because there's a lot of time when, when thing is, things aren't going well, you just want to hide and run away and not talk to anybody. And you certainly don't want to talk about it. That's me. I usually run away and hide. Um, but there are certain people who just keep pulling me out and putting that little fishing line out to hook me back, and which is just enough to get to the next stage often. And it is super important to be able to succeed and to be pushed. There are so many people that know my uh, skill set and ability could possibly, I could do more with it, but I have no idea myself. So they call it out and highlight pathways that I cannot possibly see myself or my open doors or push me a little bit further to challenge me um, 
and knowing what you actually need sometimes is going to come from somebody else. But those people really do need to have your best interests at heart and make sure you only surround yourself with people who have got your best interests at heart, not theirs, not a coach who's just getting paid to tell you nice things, genuinely invested in you and what you want and be on board and on the same page with that. I mean, you mentioned the word coach there. Um, so look, coaches as part of your team to, and again, it, it has to come from a place of the coach is there to serve you. And usually the way a coach does that or good coaches will be able to see something in you, as Peter just said, you know, that ability to see something within you that you can't see, but also to call out your BS, hold you accountable and help you become who you were supposed to be. Another one here, so this comes from Gary V, um, but it's, you know, there's been some comments here about imposter syndrome. Um, and some of you asked like direct message, like how, how do you overcome the actual imposter syndrome? Understand it comes from a place of fear of judgment. So you're afraid it's an ego thing. You're afraid of being judged and how you're going to be perceived. You're, you want to be loved by everyone. This is definitely part of my personality style. Um, and Gary V's advice on this is, is just to air all of your dirty laundry, put all of your weaknesses out there, just own them and say, this is who I am. And it reduces the leverage because once people know the, the worst about you, they can't be used against you anymore. You've just actually built your own immunity system. You've built your own defense because it doesn't matter anymore. So sometimes, and this is why things like in the startup world, things like fuck up nights, failure nights, um, startup wakes, that's why they're so cathartic and powerful is exactly because you get to air it all. And I, I've, I've spoken at four fuck up nights. I've shared my business failures um, and some personal ones. And it was the most cathartic moment that just empowered me to realize that the things that I thought were my worst features or my worst values are actually my most powerful value. And um, it's transformational. So I've personally done this. I, I need to keep pushing myself more on this. Um, but I think it's really important is actually I'm on the wrong slide at this point. Um, it should be this slide. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's really important. And the, perception that you should be nailing all the things is half of the problem because there's no such thing as nailing all the things and anyone who is nailing all the things is lying somewhere along the line and you may definitely have a period of time where you feel in alignment things are working in your personal life and your work or business is rocking and then stuff changes life happens it's just it's just how it is all we can control though is how we feel about it and how we react to those types of things and learn and grow and shift and change and move through the motions but Yeah, it looks like you've frozen up there, Peter. But um, hopefully Peter will reanimate soon. But yeah, so the, this um, also comes back to the work by Brene Brown to, um, you know, that... that another way to do it. Oh, you so come, it's important. You, you cut out for a bit there. Oh, when did, when did it cut out? I've oh. lost my train of thought. <laughs> probably, it's probably about 20 seconds. Uh, I think... Uh, I think you probably got the main, main gist of it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to round it out and say, um, it comes back to Brene Brown's work on the, you know, the, the, the courage to be vulnerable and, and vulnerably saying, you know what, I don't, know, I don't know the answers. And I think the thing about combating imposter syndrome as well is it's just owning that. It's just saying, well, this, this is, I don't know all the answers, but here's why I'm really passionate about doing this. Um, and mm -hmm. here's what I want to learn. And sometimes our role isn't to know everything. It's just to be the best facilitator of other people's knowledge and tell their stories. Now. I had a founder, I just want to share, I'm um, sorry, I had a founder who um, that I'm working with or hoping to work with soon actually, uh, who was willing to give away almost 50% of her company um, to a co-founder, to a new co-founder um, because she thought she wasn't businessy enough, yet she'd gone and built, she's actually gone and built this amazing company uh, and she's a mum who had an idea and executed on it with no previous business experience, but has a huge amount of traction. And I pretty much said that you cannot do, you cannot do this. And let me just paint the picture of what the business experience that you think you don't have is all the stuff that you've actually gone and done. So often we have a perception of what a person, an entrepreneur or a business looks like, should be doing, how they're operating, what circles they're mix, mixing in, what they're talking about. 
But really the person actually doing the stuff is the person in business. They are the business person and that's their version of being a business person. It could be people who go and talk about business but never actually go and start anything. So there's so many different things in it. This is the way the comparison can be so dangerous. Um, and just to take credit sometimes for the stuff you've actually done and doing and continue to do. Yeah, I, so I've noticed um, two of you have said you have to go and I totally understand. So you will be able to access the YouTube recording afterwards. Um, Jess also asked if we could run a um, peak persona failure night, a fuck up night for our community. I think that's absolutely a great idea. So yes, let's do that. Um, now the thing is at some point we do fail and um, this uh, concept of a 40% rule comes from the Navy SEALs and David Goggin's um, book, You Can't Hurt Me or Can't Hurt Me. But basically the concept of the 40% rule is the point at which most of us give up, we've actually only hit 40% of what we're capable of. We're actually leaving the other 60% in the tank. It's our unrealized potential. And this comes back to the same thing we've been talking about. It's because our brain gives up before our body. We tell ourselves we can't. And so if you read um, Goggin's book, it's a lot about pushing through. And it's a lot about, you know, that point of you want to give up, actually just keep going. And again, it comes back to grit, to Angela Duckworth's research. If you do that, you're more likely to be successful in whatever it is you're trying to do. So in our Peak Persona programs, um, one of our programs, we have Goggins Days, which are exactly on this Navy SEALs principle. And that is go and massively exceed a previous personal best. And we've had people do that who, you know, normally might do 40 sit-ups, who suddenly do 400. Um, like it's, it's insane what you can actually do once you tell yourself to keep going. So think about that and everything that you do, where, where do you normally stop and why do you stop there? Just do one more. And when you've done that one, do one more. And when you've done that one, do one more and just keep going. But we will fail. At some point, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to get things wrong. And the thing about failure is we need to look at it with this lens of an opportunity to learn. So a word that we use a lot in the startup ecosystem, I think it originally came from the Polonizer guys, but learn, learning through failure. In fact, when we look at our kids, this is how toddlers, babies learn. It doesn't matter how many times you tell your kid, don't touch the stove. They touch the stove and burn their hand. And you know what? That one moment teaches them for the rest of their life. And going back to the elephant at the start, baby elephant syndrome, it's the same thing. You have to be really conscious of what your failures are teaching you. You have to be, are, are they teaching you don't try again? Is that the lesson that you tell yourself? Or is a lesson you tell yourself, how might I do it differently next time? So I love the Mel Robbins quote here, which is things don't happen to you. You are not a victim to anything. It the, it's the opportunity of who you can become as a result of it. And when you think of it that way, positive versus negative, dark versus light, you have a completely different outcome. You rewire your brain in a different way. Um, use notes. So um, Eleanor Carey on her row across the ocean had pre-written notes to herself. Um, these are things like just to remind you of why you're doing something, messages, they could be affirmations, they could be quotes. It could be um, pre-recorded videos that you watch back. You might record yourself a video. So one thing um, I've done before is future letters. I, I write myself a letter for the future. Um, so I'm, I predict how I'm going to feel in the future at a particular moment. Um, so for me, for example, going through separation, well, I wrote myself letters in advance, um, messages, even SMS in advance about, you know, leaving the house and how that would feel. And basically to me, my, my triggers and language, it's very much like, hey, idiot, this is what you're feeling right now. Of course, that's what you should be feeling. That's perfectly normal. Like you chose this. This is why you're here. And it's just that reminder of, oh yeah, that's right. They're supposed to feel like this. This is what learning feels like. So you can use messages to yourself. Um, they could be affirmations. They could be quotes. And then also getting messages from others. So Eleanor, before she got in the boat, um, had Peter and I write letters to her that she would open at, at you know, certain moments on the, on the row when she needed it. Mark Salby got people to write him messages and the crew actually put them on boards that put them in the water that he could read while he was swimming um, or you know, even held them up on big signs. And um, it's really powerful. It's very powerful to be, to, because otherwise you've got these other loops of thoughts in your head and you need a circuit breaker. Tracking progress. So obviously, um, the more we track something, the more likely we are to achieve it. In fact, the studies show this. People who track their exercise routines or actually track their weight are more likely to achieve their goals. Um, it's been proven enough times over, yet most of us don't do it. Most of us don't even set the goal of, like for all of you right now, how many of you have a goal of where you want to be in the next 30 days? 
Where do you want to be in your life, in your business, whatever your hard thing is? If it's a hard conversation, when have you set a time for when that hard conversation is going to be done by? If you haven't, it's never going to happen. Until you schedule it, it doesn't get done. So actually tracking our progress and measuring against goals is really important. Post-action report. Peter, do you want to talk about the, the post-action report from David Goggins? Yeah, so the post-action report um, is just a really simple tool to make sure that, and it's quite similar to doing a daily reflection, which is something we get our program participants to do. It can be done post activities, a certain day. It could be um, anything which you have gone and done or achieved or engaged in to do a little bit of a check-in with yourself to think how you actually went at it. Because it's, it, because it's making you become present in the moment and to look critically at the actual output so that you can consciously make a choice to either shift and change, improve, or, or give yourself a little bit of credit to if something went really well, it's a scheduled moment in time where you can give yourself a little bit of credit, pat on the back, positivity, or say, that didn't go so well. I should have either planned for it earlier or um, I didn't get in the right headspace. I was really nervous because I know my morning was out of control and I didn't allow enough time to get there and I arrived and I was behind the eight ball. Or um, I didn't do enough research to who I was speaking to and I got there and I felt really underprepared and I had a massive imposter syndrome. And so you would only know these things if you do it immediately after the fact. Because if you let it go a day, life happens, you get busy, you can over, you know, your, your thoughts consume the experience and you can move past it too quickly. Whereas if you stop, take a moment in time to schedule these little quick note take, often I'll do it on the notes on my phone or um, if it's an event like this, for example, Aaron and I, we usually have a call to say, what do we think worked? We, if this was too long, that wasn't, those questions were good, maybe we could do something like that. So we have to do it while it's fresh and it's about freeing up mental space so that you can deal with it while it's here then after the fact, you can park it and move on to the next thing with 100% clarity and presence in that next moment. It's, it's the step change, transition moment, and be able to close one chapter, do things to completion, and then go on to the next one. Yeah, and that, that timing aspect. So, you know, some of you said uh, you wanted to do more running. And so, so if you go for a run and you just, you, it's not right, your, your shoes are uncomfortable, you get blisters, and you do your little post-action report of what will I do differently next time I'm going to wear different shoes. Right in that moment, buy the other set of shoes. Drive to the store and do it then because if you put it off, you'll put off the next thing and the next thing. It just won't get done. So absolutely do it in the moment. Um, just a question from Jess. Jess, um, we might answer it towards the end and we'll just, because we're pretty close to the end of the content. I'm actually and... typing. I'm typing a response. Oh, okay, great. Um, another part of this is capturing and logging your journey. And, you know, this could be as simple as picking up your phone and just recording video logs. So Peter and I get peak persona participants to um, record little end of day reflections, but maybe for you it's journaling and, and gratitude journaling is definitely a part of this. Maybe it's writing a blog, but capturing the journey will help you identify how much you've actually grown. Because often we're so busy looking at our gap, what we don't have, what we haven't done, what we're not doing, that we actually forget to look backwards at how far we have come. Um, so capture and log your journey because it's really powerful. And another key part of that is celebrating your wins. Um, even if it's a small win, like I went for a run today. It, okay. It was only 10 minutes, but I did it. I like just take a moment to celebrate that. Um, celebrating with others is really important because it compounds the effect. And we, we have endorphins around like social interactions are endorphin moments. Um, and it reinforces the positivity in our, in our brain, in our wetware. Uh, so then we're more likely to do things again. Because remember, we're pleasure seeking. So celebrate your wins. And it's, a, it's an act of gratitude. So we've covered a heap of techniques. Hopefully, you're now no longer the should have, could have, would have. And you're now in the category of doing. The question is, will you? So... As we said before, self-help content is the most consumed but unactioned content. Um, so all of this is absolutely pointless unless you actually take action. If you want to change in your life, if you want to do hard things, you need to change. So right now, what we want you to do is open your calendar and book in a 30-minute slot for some time this week, so this afternoon, tomorrow, Friday, where you are going to go through the slides and actually convert every slide into an action item. So you're actually gonna act on 
facing your hard things. Because if you don't act on it, you won't do it. 84% of people never achieve their goals, never take action even towards achieving their goals. They just don't do it. So are you in the 84% or are you in the other 16%? So I'm giving you a moment now to put that in your calendar, 30 minutes to actually come up with your action items. So noticing all we're doing right now is taking a micro action to create a calendar, to create the time, to actually then take the bigger action. We're breaking this down into chunks, into bricks, and then you'll go through the content and slides and go through it. While you're booking your calendars, and it's great to see some of you messaging to say you've done that, um, Peter's asked us to repeat the four letters from earlier. So it's JFDI, just fucking do it, JFDI. All right, so I'm gonna assume that everyone has added a 30 minute slot to their calendar to review the content and actually come up with their action items. Um, just some quick other reference material for you and then we're gonna just spend time on Q&A. But these two pieces of content, um, podcasts are very valuable. Mel Robbins, um, Take Control of Your Life. She basically does live interviews um, with people, get, helping them get through their own bullshit stories. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of life lessons in there. And then Tough Girl Podcast is all female adventurers um, typically who've done, like they're not, under, isn't it right, Peter? Like they're not typically adventurers, but they're just they're not, they're, to... No, some of them are adventurers. Um, the Sarah Williams, who, st who hosts the podcast, was, is someone who's into adventure and started chatting to people who have gone and done some crazy things like oh, Eleanor and her row. Um, hang on, sweet, hang on a second. Um, I, hang on a second. You're going to need to fill this one no, up. No I've got problem. To, oh, no, it's right, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they are people who have gone and chosen to do an adventure and she just chats about the journey on how they made the decision, why they chose to do that thing, what they learned along the way. And often they then find a love for it and then go and continue to do more and she'll get them back on the show. And they eventually have, they have become an adventurer after a while, or they've learned to create an income off blogging about it or sharing their stories or becoming speakers. But it is the most uh, motivational I've, I've found in the last 18 months. Sometimes I just needed to escape my reality and drift off into another world and hear people's stories. And that was the, it was the content, that I created around building a micro tribe came from listening to the tough girl podcast simply because every person in there who went and did some sort of a challenge talked about these key people in their lives that were significant to either pushing them, challenging them, questioning them, supporting them at different points that were pivotal in their success, either in going back into uh, mainstream life or shifting and changing their career and focus altogether. Um, and it's usually people go and do these large adventures at a transition period in their life when they're searching for something else, but they need to go and do something to really shake them up and they'll choose something that's they've never done before. A lot of these people will go and hike across four countries and never actually gone on a hike before. But then afterwards they learn what they need to learn, they understand themselves and they come back um, a bit changed. Yeah. Um, just one other thing that we can offer. So we, we do extended disc personality profiles, which basically help you identify more about yourself, the way you behave, the way you communicate, but more importantly, what you need um, in order to go and do hard things. So if you are interested in understanding yourself a little bit more, coming back to that intellectual honesty piece about yourself, then uh, please do um, feel free to jump on there. It, it, there is a, a price associated with it, but you get a 27 page report that details your psychology how you think, how you work, what you need to, what you need in order to do things. So definitely a, a big step in understanding yourself. And we do offer coaching. So we coach a number of founders, entrepreneurs, investors. Um, our coaching style is very much to empower you to um, achieve who you are always supposed to be. So putting the ownership back on yourself. And we noticed there's a, a couple of people we coach actually on, on this webinar, which was awesome. Otherwise our contact details are there, but really we'd love to do Q and A and I appreciate we've, we bang up on the 90 minutes, uh, so we have gone a bit over. But if any of you have questions or any, if you ask questions before and we haven't addressed them, um, please drop them in as well. But at this point, if you have to bail, totally understood. Um, but if you do have questions, we're more than happy to hang around for a little bit longer. Uh, so a question about psychometrics require qualifications. Um, I actually disagree with that. So we use extended disc, which is a, um, it's the most popular um, psychometric, psychometric profiling tool in the world. Over a million um, people complete it each year. So we use that as a, um, as a tool. So you basically complete an online assessment. It produces a, a detailed report, which we coach people through. So 
our context is in the human piece, so helping people understand the report um, and helping them actually identify their, their own BS and what they tell themselves. Um, so yeah, you can jump online. Extended disk is popular. You could, you could go and research it if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, slides, absolutely. So we'll be sharing the, um, yes. So we'll be sharing a link to the slides in the YouTube recording when we put that video up. So I'll aim to have that done within the next couple of hours and you'll get an email this afternoon. So I'll be ready for your 30 minute time slot. Awesome, so really good positive feedback. Thank you. Um, thanks, Adam. So it resonates with you. You've got time to take action. That's great. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lucy. It's like we need to have a check-in. We need to have a, a date in time where we check back and see if everybody went and created something on the back of this. So, hey, look, let us know if that's of interest to you. If you did want to do a catch-up session and share with everybody else and have a bit more of an interactive session uh, with the rest of the members on the webinar to check in and see what you actually went and did because that's also an option. Yep. Awesome, Margaret. That's awesome. Yeah, it's fascinating to see um, the variety of hard things from fitness goals to writing a book to hard conversations to launching something new, like the variety of things that we're all um, aiming to achieve. It's really phenomenal. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie's key takeaway is 54321. Actually, that would be awesome for any of you that do want to share your key takeaway. That, that's really useful for us to know as well because we're always fascinated by the different things people take away from our, from our sessions. Yep. Cool. Well, if there's no other specific questions, um, we might wrap up here and you'll get an email through with a link to the YouTube and to the slides. And thanks, Bades. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vanessa, five second rules. Um, Jordan's key takeaway, don't lie to yourself. Baden's key takeaway, listen. <laughs> I, I think, oh, sorry, you're correcting the comment before. Yes, awesome. Um, yeah, very cool. Anything else you wanted to add to wrap up, Peter? No, um, I think there's a lot in there and I, it's like anything, you can be overwhelmed and walk away from this and do nothing or you can do a couple of things and want to do everything but need to actually just focus on a few key things and I think even just identifying something small that maybe you could action this week because next week's always too late, even tomorrow is probably too late. What's the one thing you can maybe do today? Is it that you get to bed a tiny bit earlier? Is it that you... Uh, don't go on social media. Is it you have more water? Is it something like one of those tiny things that you could do just today so that you'll wake up tomorrow and going, wow, I actually did that yesterday. Yeah. Vanessa's already scheduled her toad task time, which is awesome. That's um, cool. Alicia's asking how to apply this in the, and influence others in the workplace. So, so this is a lot of um, where Peter and I spend a, a lot of time and, and helping teams and team leaders. Uh, it's a tough one. So maybe jump on our YouTube channel uh, we have a lot of other webinars we've delivered recently around taking, leading people through change, uh, managing change, how to deal with ambiguity. And some of the tips and techniques in there might help you. But one in particular was our Tribal Leaders Toolkit, which we delivered two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and so it, look, it's, the short answer is it's difficult. It's difficult to implement this into workplaces. In terms of influence, it is the best way to influence is to storytell and to share experience on what you're doing how it made you feel because you can't make people do things that's that's what it, the reality of it is you cannot make people do things you can highlight uh, all the benefits of why to do something you can share your own experience um, you can have little prompts you can have instead of big changes you can introduce swaps so if it's something dietary related instead of having this maybe you could consider this or um getting people to encourage them to go outside for lunch opposed to like just tiny little changes and prompts and in the workplace you can have visual triggers around the place whether it's in the in the lunch room or at people's desks or something that is just a little tiny reminder to do something just a little bit different or connect to another human or have that social interaction to build the relationships and um, share stories and create that openness and the opportunity to have open conversations yeah, it comes back to what you were talking about at the start, Peter. When, when someone's told to do something, they, they immediately go no. And, and we gave the 10 points on the slide about why people do that. And 
like I can share, I, I, I did intermittent fasting a couple of years ago and I remember telling people I was going to do it and everyone was like, well, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you not eat? Why would you blah, blah, blah. And all these excuses that they were projecting onto me why I shouldn't do it. Anyway, I did it and I lost 13 kilos of body fat and then I wrote a blog post about it. And it was only after the blog post that all those people said it was the dumbest idea they'd ever heard suddenly then started going and doing the fast. And I think that's the thing is, you know, just live by example and just to Peter's comment, like just write about your experience, write about what you're doing. And if those that are interested will select in and those that aren't won't. And, and you just have to give them the freedom to make that, that decision for themselves. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Um, We've loved the, how interactive you've all been. The comments have been really great. The questions were great. That This is one of the, probably the more interactive sessions we've done recently. So thank you. Yeah. Um, but please yeah. do reach out if we can help. And uh, as we said, the content will be coming out to you this afternoon.